Uh, hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the IIEA. It's a pleasure to have our speaker today, uh, Dr. Philip Lane, who will speak to us uh, from his position as one of the six members of the executive board of the European Central Bank. He's five years into that term. It's a particularly interesting time, I suppose, in the world of central banking at the moment. Uh, with an anticipation of interest rate cuts coming down the line, of which I'm sure he'll talk a little uh, bit about during his presentation. Philip will speak for, sorry, just ran up the stairs there, slightly out of breath. Um, uh, Philip will speak for about 20 minutes. He'll give a presentation, uh, which is visible here and I think in the other room. Uh, and then we'll go to uh, questions and answers. So, uh, Philip, very uh, many thanks for joining us today. The floor is yours. So uh, good afternoon, and uh, I should say also if you struggle to, to see the screen, uh, the speech and the charts on the ECB website, so, so you can also look on your phone uh, uh, as well. Uh, so the my, my goal today is really to review where we are on inflation and in turn uh, what that implies for, for uh, monetary policy. Uh, and this is the... Um, the kind of uh, uh, main uh, overview graph. So when I when I joined the ECB in uh, June 2019, uh, we were basically confronted for a number of years uh, with inflation visibly below the target of 2%, uh, which is true for the blue line, which is overall inflation, and also true for the orange line, which is core, core inflation. And a, a lot of the discussion before the pandemic was, how do we deal with this? And in September 2019, we, we added some extra measures. We cut the interest rate from uh, minus 0 0.4 to minus 0 0.5. Uh, 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 we, we, did, we did some balance sheet operations as well uh, at that time. Then in the first year of the pandemic, uh, the, the initial impact of the pandemic uh, with the shutdown of the economy was actually deflationary. So oil pr prices, for example, fell out during 2020. And you can see from the blue line that inflation turned slightly negative in, in late 2020. So, so that overall uh, dynamic was deflationary initially in the, in the pandemic. Then at the end of 2020, uh, the vaccines were announced. There's still a lot of uncertainty, by the way, because it wasn't sure you know, how quickly would these vaccines be rolled out. Uh, would new variants uh, outpace the vaccines in terms of effectiveness? So for quite a long time in 2021, there was uncertainty about uh, the exact uh, speed and certainty of the recovery. But in any event, you can see here the blue line, uh, inflation started to move up. And then uh, from mid-21 onwards, it was above our target of, of 2%. And if you think about the late 2021, there's a big debate in America and here about whether the, this surge inflation would would, uh, would be self-correcting in the sense of that it, there were some, some temporary forces, especially uh, supply chain bottlenecks around the world, which once they were resolved, would see inflation come down again. But of course, uh, that debate never concluded because in February 22, we had a second inflation shock, which is the Russia invasion of Ukraine. And, and then we had, uh, for six months, from February to August 22, a really big increase in, in gas prices. Uh, and uh, this, this second uh, shock added to the ongoing effects of the in initial shock in 21, which ended up with inflation being at 10.6% in October 22, which, of course, is, is very high. Uh, and then uh, what we've seen since then is the decline, is the, the, the uh, reversion. So inflation now is at 2.4%, having been at 10.6. By the way, the uh, December 22 uh, ECB forecast, so just after that peak inflation rate, basically said most of the inflation would disappear in the course of, of 2023, um, and which, is, which held up uh, pretty well uh, last year. So you might say, uh, uh, why am I talking about inflation if a lot of the inflation ha has uh, has reverted? Well, there is a legacy footprint. Uh, and uh, the way to think about it is in this graph here, which basically divides the overall inflation between the main categories that Eurostat uh, tracks. 
energy, food, uh, goods and services. And what you can see here is when inflation was surging, uh, it was basically a lot of it was energy and in a connected way, food. Food is very energy intensive in, in production. And then we also had a, for many years, goods inflation was basically invisible because with globalization, technical progress, the cost of buying a new fridge, a new TV and so on was basically, uh, you know, going down, if anything, or remaining constant, it was not going up. Whereas in 2021, uh, 22, there was a, a big increase in the price of goods. So what you see now is all of those components have basically faded away. What remains now is uh, services inflation. So services inflation um, it, it is still uh, quite high. Uh, and this is why uh, the ECB still has concerns. And if you like, the, the this boils down to the question of that initial inflation shock triggered new inflation dynamics, uh, which essentially will show up in services inflation. And uh, if we if we don't uh, run our monetary policy to basically contain it, the fear would be that there's a kind of legacy of a permanently higher inflation rate coming from the services sector. And, and this is why uh, uh, we are so focused on this. And I'll come back to what drives services inflation in a couple of minutes. Okay, so um, when we try to think about inflation, monetary policy affects the economy and inflation with a lag. So we, we tend not to focus on uh, what is the inflation rate today? Uh, because of course, in any given month, there's going to be volatility because of energy prices, uh, weather shocks and so on. What we're trying to say is, okay, what is the underlying trend in inflation? Which is basically, you can think of it as, where is inflation going to be one year from now? So underlying inflation is basically looking at measures which are the best predictors of one year ahead inflation. Uh, and uh, what you see here is compared to last August, the reason why I picked last August is it's just before the September decision when we made our hike to 4%. So the environment last August had these measures, uh, uh, you know, okay, some of them were already near 2% but some were still above four. And what we've seen over th these months is these measures for underlying inflation ha have uh, come down quite a bit. They've narrowed. And so they are now clustered in, in, the, in the twos. Uh, this is only one way to think about the issue. But what it does say is that the amount of inflation momentum in the system is less then we were finalizing the, the hiking cycle uh, a number of months ago. So again, you might say, well, if that is true for overall inflation, uh, where's your concern? So, let, so again, let me connect it back to, to what I just showed you in terms of goods inflation has gone low, food inflation has come down, energy inflation is, is, is contained. Uh, and uh, uh, I earlier on presented you with services inflation, there's a connected concept called domestic inflation. The reason why I say domestic inflation, not just services inflation, is some goods are basically mostly local. So domestic inflation uh, kicks out, if you like, the traded element in the economy and focuses on what's produced locally in the area. And, uh, and these numbers are still above 4%. They have come down. And uh, here, uh, I not only show you the, the overall domestic inflation rate, but measures which try to kind of look underneath the hood to the kind of more persistent element by kicking out outliers, basically. Uh, and those measures have come down a bit uh, this year. But more or less, when domestic inflation is running at 4%, you might think uh, policy should remain uh, cautious. Okay, so a lot of domestic inflation is coming from services. So what I want to emphasize here is it's very important to recognize the services sector is quite diverse. You have uh, some services like transportation, which are very energy intensive. Uh, you have other services which are very business to business type services. 
So the demand for those services would be very connected to what's going on in the corporate world. Uh, and then you have traditional consumer facing services, uh, which people often think about. So what I want to say to you here is uh, there's a category called contact intensive services, which is basically, you can imagine, was very affected by the pandemic. So this is tourism, hospitality, going out to a bar or a restaurant. And what you can see here is when the European economy reopened in, in uh, around April 22, the inflation rate in that sector went quite high. And even last summer, it was nearly 8%. Because essentially, there's a very hot, strong demand after being locked away in the pandemic. And the supply side of that sector was very compromised. Airlines had got rid of a lot of capacity. Hotels had lost their workforce in many parts of Europe and so on. That sector has seen a big cooling. So that sector, the inflation rate has come down from about eight to around four. So you might say, again, that looks like it's, it's kind of trending in the right direction. Less so is, is what's called a wage intensive services. So these are sectors where a lot of the cost is labor. And if you can penetrate this graph, labor intensive services is the light blue line, which is still north of 4%. And maybe the, the point to notice here is it's, it looks very similar to the red line, which is compensation per employee. So it, a lot of it is driven by the rate of increase of wages. And this is why, you know, uh, the ECB has been talking a lot about wage dynamics, because for that category of the economy, what's happening to wages ha has consequences for the prices that firms charge. So, so that, that in the next step in, in, in this uh, discussion, uh, let me look at this in, in two ways. What, one is the hard data. Uh, and uh, what I show you here is uh, compensation per employee from the national accounts, compensation per hour, uh, and then uh, what's called negotiated wages, uh, which is a subcomponent. Um, but we actually have the data of Q1 for negotiated wages. We don't yet have the data for compensation per employee and compensation per hour. Uh, and uh, there's really two messages here. One is uh, for, for compensation per employee, which is the most general measure, it has come down from a peak about a year ago, um, in indeed Q1 uh, uh, 2023. So it was running north of 5% and it's come down. But what's also true is in the data that came out a couple a few days ago, negotiated wages, in fact, uh, moved up slightly in, in Q1. So this remains a kind of an important issue. Are we seeing enough wage deceleration for, for overall inflation to come back to target next year. And so uh, rather than uh, rely just on these uh, Eurostat numbers, which are, you know, come, you know, aggregates across countries in a, uh, you know, in a, in a way that, that the statisticians uh, uh, can only do so much with, what the ECB has done uh, in these years is to build a weight tracker. Because essentially, you know, uh, in, from the various national central banks, the big ones, they can see what the wage settlements are every week. They can see what different unions are settling for. And remember, in many European countries, what the settlement is with the union then covers a very broad sector. So even non-unionized workers will be paid the same wage uh, in, many, in many countries. Uh, and so uh, here, uh, the, the messages are, you can see it is the the uh, the blue line is essentially the overall uh, wage tracker, so that aggregates across all agreements. So in that, there could be an agreement in uh, January twenty twenty three, which specifies wage increases not just on day one of the contract, but says you will get X in twenty twenty three, you'll get Y in twenty twenty four, you might get Z in twenty twenty five. So we track as th those contracts are executed because there's a schedule of forward uh, pay increases incorporated there. Um, so it, it kind of averages across different vintages. The latest agreement, which is the red line, 
And then the blue line is the average of the latest agreement and old agreements, which are still in force. And so what you see here um, is essentially the message that uh, the new agreements, the Ford, the red line has been coming down. And over time, that, that should lead the overall average to coming down. But also we know from, from the agreements that are being signed is they may still have significant pay increases now, but what they are saying for what the pay increase would be later this year, it's coming down. So that dotted blue line, you see uh, uh, some movement down later this year. But it, probably in fairness, the overall message is bumpy, that uh, there is some deceleration compared to what we taught uh, at the end of last year, but but it's fairly, fairly slow. This is not a, a kind of very rapid uh, uh, a decline in the nominal wages. Let me add in also the, the green line, which is the Indeed Wage Tracker, which is produced in collaboration with the Central Bank of Ireland. So it's a nice collaboration between the Central Bank and Indeed. And what Indeed uh, shows are the, are the wages in a very granular way uh, included in job ads. So this is one part of the uh, labour market, someone who's looking for a new job. But clearly, if the market for a new job is very hot, it also puts pressure on, on the wage uh, claims of existing workers. Because if you see, say, look, you can credibly threaten to walk away. So the accountant in the job ad is getting X. You better pay me or I'll, 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 I'll move in that direction. And that has come down uh, much more visibly. Uh, and so in terms of being a forward indicator, the, the indeed uh, uh, deceleration is also there. So what I've given you so far is basically very aggregated uh, uh, data, but we also ask the firms. So the corporate telephone survey, it's a very quaint title, the telephone survey, uh, it is a survey of, of a very structured survey of large firms in Europe. It's a rotating panel. Uh, it will inc include some large Irish firms every so often. But here the message is the blue, the blue line is what they said they were paying out last year. And the orange line is what they say they're paying out this year. And it's clearly moved to the left. There's a lot more wage settlements, three to four, four to five. And the jumbo pay settlements that they were making last year are less than evident. So again, there's evidence from the large firms of, of deceleration. And then we also ask the, uh, the uh, SAFE, the, this is a very large survey, includes lots of SMEs. And again, over the course of the last year, across different sectors, their expectations of what they would need to pay their workers has again visibly decelerated over, over that time. So what I would say is uh, there is some evidence of deceleration, but it's hardly uh, a time to declare we fully expect wages to reattach to a kind of their long run, that normal pattern that we require. Uh, so uh, we, we will need to be quite data dependent on that um, uh, in the coming months. And then in terms of my, my chart presentation, uh, this is the last one, which is again to say um, this year, because I showed you at the start a big decline in inflation over the last year and a half. But we also can look ahead and see oh, over the coming months, we basically think inflation is going to bounce around the current level. So there's several reasons for that. One is at the end of 2022, especially governments across Europe introduced a lot of measures to contain energy costs for households. There's a really big set of measures in every country. Now the detail different across countries but this year, a lot of these are being uh, removed. So VAT rates are going up in some countries. Other types of subsidies are being removed. So uh, this is a classic. If you in, in, introduce kind of uh, versions of price controls, when you lift those price controls, the price level goes up. But that's a one-time only effect. It's not going to repeat next year. It, it's something that's raising prices this year and not next year. Second, if you look at the uh, energy prices last year, there was an uptick over the summer. Um, and so the, the base effects are not stable over the course of the year. Uh, and uh, for, for these reasons, um, we, we do expect basic inflation to be relatively flat this year. 
Whereas in, in our March projections, we said, okay, then uh, next year, when this is over, we should see a, another phase of disinflation bring us back to target later next year. Why is that? Because uh, we think wages this year will be less than last year in terms of growth rate, even more so next year. So 2025 wages will grow more slowly than 2024 wages. Uh, we expect uh, the ability of firms to raise prices will be uh, limited by, by, by the stance of monetary policy. Um, and there's a lot of uh, disinflation because monetary policy works with a lag. What we did uh, with, with the 10 hikes will still be working its way through the system for quite a while to come. And this is why we do in the March forecast have inflation coming back to target uh, next year. Let me emphasize this is at the same time as we expect a significant recovery in the European economy. And that might may sound odd. How can you reduce inflation while at the same time see a recovery? But this is in the context of inflation being a lot lower than that 10.6%. This year, wages are growing more quickly than inflation. As households see their real incomes going up uh, after a long time of not raising their consumption, uh, we should see stronger consumption this year. We should see stronger exporting because the world economy is, is normalizing, even though it's, it's not going super quickly. Uh, essentially, the uh, demand for goods is, is, it went high in the pandemic. People overbought goods and it went very low. And now it should be going back to a more normal pattern. So for these reasons, uh, this combination of inflation falling and the economy picking up, uh, we, we think is a reasonable baseline. Let me mention also before I turn to monetary policy that essentially we, we not only look at the, the baseline, but also about risk. Uh, and uh, compared to last August, before we made our last hike, uh, a number of risk indicators have improved. One is because energy prices came down more quickly than expected uh, at the end of last year. 2020, 2024 inflation is, is less now than, than we, we had projected uh, six months ago. So in September last year, the staff expected inflation 2024 to be 3.2. Um, in March, that was revised to 2.3. So 2324. Um, so that's a much lower inflation rate already. Also, uh, in terms of when we ask professional forecasters, where do you think inflation is going to be five years from now? the number of forecasters who are skeptical that inflation will come back to 2% has gone down. In, in the financial markets, the kind of risk premium to protect yourself against inflation has declined on a five-year five -year basis by about 40 basis points since last summer. Uh, and the option uh, market, the options market, also has seen a decline in the probability of inflation being noticeably above 2%. In our consumer survey, there's also been an improvement in confidence levels that inflation would be more or less at target and the same in our firm survey. So lots of indicators where even last summer, there were still concerns about whether inflation would come back to 2%. A, a lot of these surveys are more confident now. Okay, so let, let me spend the last couple of minutes talking about the implications for monetary policy. So it's very important uh, that essentially um, when this very large inflation surge happened, there was two elements of, of monetary policy. One, the combination of high inflation and very low interest rates is very unstable because essentially people say, well, you know, I should borrow a lot of money because the real interest rate is very negative. I should buy something now because the inflation rate's going up. So to avoid that pro-cyclicality, it was important that we raise interest rates from where they were. And then the second phase of being restrictive, where we have been since uh, the end of 22, is to make sure that the initial inflation shock inevitably needed would mean wages would go up, other prices would go up as their costs went up over time. So it's made to make sure that this is not a self-feeding process, to make sure that there would need to be compensation for backward inflation, but the, the, you know, uh, firms or, or unions could not argue, we also need to be compensated for future inflation. Because if in future inflation is credibly at 2%, then that puts a lid on the, on the wage negotiation. 
Uh, and so we, we do think um, that that backward element has been important, but it is becoming less important. At this point, there have already been pretty large wage increases. The real wage gap, the amount needed to fully compensate for the inflation that happened is a lot lower or, or has disappeared in some countries. With inflation lower this year than previously expected, then the wage deals later this year and next year should be lower. Um, I mentioned already this year, this inflation's uh, bump, bumping up because of the reverse of fiscal measures. That won't be in the data to the same extent next year. And then the monetary policy with the lags, uh, even if we cut rates in June, the lags of the tightening years will still be working forward. So on that basis, the the uh, uh, the tightening cycle ha has done it, done its job. So let me then talk about uh, what might happen um, if we decide to cut rates in June. Uh, what is going to happen in terms of the subsequent pace of rate reductions? So uh, many considerations will be relevant. Uh, so I, I think we can probably all agree with some straightforward principles. Uh, the pace of rate cuts would be slower if there are upward surprises to underlying inflation, especially in relation to the underlying dynamics of domestic and service and services inflation, and if there's, if there's upward surprises to the level of demand. So if the e European economy is showing signs of a demand-led recovery, because uh, the level of demand is important for the medium-term inflation outlook. And equally, the pace of rate cuts will be faster if there are downward surprises to underlying inflation and to the level of demand. So we will be very data dependent, looking at the incoming data saying, okay, is this moving our beliefs in one direction or the other direction? So, so I think that's kind of a, one set of arguments. A second issue is in relation to the strength of monetary transmission. So we have to take into account the hiking we already did is still working through the system. For example, if you had a fixed rate mortgage, which is expiring, until now, you've not had to make a bigger monthly payment. But if now, as you replace that fixed rate mortgage with a new mortgage, you will be facing a higher monthly payment. So, so the monetary tightening uh, will be you know, increasing over time for that, for that basis. So our modeling suggests that the impact on inflation of the tightening cycle uh, will still be working its, its way through even next year. A second issue is now that inflation is expected to be lower, the real impact of a given level of, of interest rates is larger. And so there's always an interconnection between expected inflation and monetary transmission, which we should allow for. A third element, which I think we have to be open-minded about, is the overall restrictiveness of financial conditions depends on the evolution of term premia and risk premia. And these term premia and risk premia are not just made in Europe, they reflect global factors. So the evolution of these risk premia will be important. And then finally, uh, let me mention this two-sided risks. In all of this, we say, of course, if we uh, cut too quickly, then uh, we would face a problem if inflation turns out to be more persistent than, than we expect in the baseline. Um, however, in the other direction, if we wait too long, uh, inflation could not only return to target, but could fall below the target. And if it's below the target in a material way, then we would have to do uh, accelerated rate cuts later on, uh, and even going below the neutral level to restore the inflation trend. So for these reasons, um, you know, it makes sense for us to continue following a data-dependent, meeting-by-meeting approach to deciding the appropriate level of interest rates. Uh, we, we, are, we are not pre-committed to any particular speed. Uh, this speed will evolve uh, in line with the incoming data. And uh, I think this approach, while it might be frustrating for people who want to know more about our, our forward thinking, uh, has been effective in the tightening cycle and will be effective in the unwinding phase. So let me stop there then. Thanks. <laughs>
thank you, Philip. So we're now open uh, to questions. We have about, I think, four, three or four times more people online than we do here. So just so people here are aware, there's going to be uh, plenty of questions online as well. So more competition than it appears. But I, there's somebody with a hand up at the back there. If you could just identify yourself uh, as well before you put your question or your comment. Uh, thank you. It's Elena Moya from Mediolanum um, uh, International Funds. How do you manage interest rates expectations, especially other than Q4 and Q1? And uh, so far this year have been extraordinary in terms of pricing five, seven cuts, now two cuts, three cuts. Do you actively manage that or do you leave it to the market to to work out uh, itself? Or do you actively manage because that can become a self-fulfilling prophecy or or, or impact um, the the objectives of your policy? Okay, so so that's uh, I think uh, a classic issue. So last year, in March last year, we we basically adopted a, a formula, which said that the interest rates will depend on, on three factors. One is the inflation outlook, where the inflation outlook is basically a mix of the forecast and the risk assessment. The second leg was we will also look at underlying inflation. So in other words, we're not just going to be driven by the forecast, but also what we see, not in terms of the raw headline number, but when you filter it to try and get to the underlying uh, trend. And then the third component is the strength of monetary transmission. So uh, here it's partly how banks were behaving. So, so the market became very interested in the bank lending survey, for example, for, for that reason. And so the ideal, from a central bank point of view, is the market works it out. We don't have you know, special access to data. So when the inflation number comes out, when the information on underlying inflation comes out, when the information on monetary transmission comes out, the market reprices. Now, there's an extra layer on top of everyone looks at the same data so they can try and basically model the same models we have. And so if the market is uh, repricing because they basically think inflation will come down more slowly than they expected uh, at the end of last year, um, that, that basically is what we want. We want um, the market to do a lot of the, the work. The extra layer, however, of course, is the market is not predicting what they think we should do. They're trying to predict what we will do. So there's also a layer there about the reaction function of the central bank, the preferences of the ECB governing council. And there it's kind of, it's a conundrum. It's a conundrum about uh, uh, whether you try and kind of... Uh, flag that or you just basically actions speak louder than words so the more you know that as we make decisions they can they can work out what we're up to so i think the ideal is that we we do not uh communicate about future interest rate decisions and for the last year we have basically said data dependent meeting by meeting i mean i, I think at a turning point it's been reasonable for us in the last few weeks to basically signal that, uh, of course, it's all conditional between now and nine days or 10 days from now on Thursday the 6th of June, there could be major surprises. But barring major surprises, uh, you know, many people on the Governing Council, including myself this morning, have indicated there may be enough in the data to say we can remove the top layer of, of restrictiveness. So another way uh, of coming at this question is, ideally, um, uh, the, 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 we let our policy speak. And this is where there is a distinction between now and when interest rates were super low. Because in our monetary policy strategy, we said, when interest rates are basically at the lower bound, one way we do influence conditions is by basically signaling our attitude to future rate increases. Though we had four guidance, we would not raise rates until X, Y, and Z were fulfilled. However, when we're away from the lower band, 
we have a very easy way to signal to the market. We make a decision. We either raise rates or we don't raise rates or we cut rates. Uh, so all of this is basically saying, I think uh, uh, I personally am convinced that basically meeting by meeting, data dependent is the best way to go. Rather than saying, um, I expect rates to be at some number by Christmas, some other number by the end of 25. Uh, so of course we look at the market, but it, it is not a constraint in our behavior. I think that that's, that's important. Outside of uh, financially volatile conditions, most of the time the market uh, will, will adjust. And the transmission of monetary policy has been very smooth. Uh, the market has not moved very much in relation to recent because they've understood what we're doing. Right. Okay. Uh, we've got a question online here from uh, your former colleague, John O'Hagan in, in Trinity. To what extent do you and the EC, uh, do, to what extent, Philip, are ECB and Fed policies interlinked to the Federal Reserve in the United States, especially through exchange rates? It's uh, exchange rates. And does this apply in both directions? So uh, there are many channels but by which uh, there are interconnections in, in both directions. So uh, as I mentioned in the speech about uh, term premia and risk premia, if, if I, you know, uh, I'm a European corporate or European sovereign who wants to issue a five or 10 year bond, the pricing of that bond will partly depend on what the market thinks we're going to do in terms of the policy rate. But it's also going to depend on arbitrage because they say, well, you know, I could buy a five-year dollar bond. Why should I buy a five-year euro-denominated bond? So of course, if dollar-based interest rates are higher, it will spill over at the long end to the what's called a term premium. That matters because of higher US interest rates will push up the European interest rates at the long end. That on its own terms is deflationary. It's tied to financial conditions in Europe. On the other hand, uh, high US interest rates could also lead to dollar appreciation and euro depreciation, so the exchange rate channel. So what I think there's a few things here is, one, the euro area is a continental sized economy. The role of imports is, is definitely not, not zero, but we're not talking about a small open economy. We're not talking about uh, a small economy where the exchange rate is kind of dominates a lot of the dynamics. It's also important to recognize at this point, lots of global firms, when they sell to Europe, they price in euro. So if the euro dollar rate moves, the first hit is to their profit margin they don't immediately raise prices in Europe. So over several years, if the exchange rate moves, it will show up in import prices in Europe, but it's not instantaneous. It's not super strong in any one year. So I would say the exchange rate channel matters, but it matters most if there's a really large movement. We have not seen a really large Euro dollar movement. And let me remind you on a trade weighted basis, the euro is appreciating against the yen, against the Swiss franc, against various other currencies. So the trade weighted basis, so it's not U US, going back to John O'Hagan, dollar euro matters. It matters more than just the size of the US because the world is quite dollarized. Yeah. But other currencies uh, also matter. So th those are two channels working in opposite directions. A and then the, the third element is, what does the behavior of the US economy mean for the world economy? Because traditionally, if the US economy is growing very quickly, that put upper pressure on commodity prices around the world because they would import more. So, and what we have in the US is the US economy did well last year. There's also signs of deceleration. It's also true now the US is a big energy producer. So the, the, the connection between US GDP and uh, global energy prices has to take into account their supply and energy, not just demand and energy, which, which I think is very important. Uh, so uh, yeah, so this is an ongoing issue, but all of that boils down to it is we, we think about it, we care about it, but you would need to see very large movements in either the exchange rate or the term premium 
for it to become a, a super prominent in the discussion. You mentioned lags towards the end of your presentation there in terms of the amount of time it takes for interest rates to feed through. Uh, and you mentioned that past rates will continue to feed through. Have you noticed any evidence over time that the 12 to 18 month lag that it's typically been considered the, the, the time frame, has that changed at all as the economy has evolved? I think that that's a good question. And uh, I think... Uh, Let me, let me give you three parts. One part is actually has probably accelerated monetary transmission, which is basically the, the kind of sensitivity of inflation expectations to monetary policy. So more or less in the 1970s, there's a lot of indexation in the European economy. So when inflation went up, inflation was going to stay high for quite a while because the law said inflation of X last year means wage increases this year of, of Y, or price increases in index sectors. Now, uh, I think the global consensus academically and among policymakers is a very important way monetary policy works is by reassuring people the inflation episode will stop in a timely manner. That it will not take that long. So, this is a little bit by way of counterfactual. If we had not uh, tightened policy, I'm pretty sure quite rapidly inflation would have gone up even more quickly. So in that sense, transmission has speeded up. In terms of the impact on the, subject to that, in terms of the impact on the economy, there are two forces which may be slowing it down. One is the prevalence of fixed rate mortgages which does mean eventually it works, but it takes a while. Two is this, you know, which is a good thing, it is the stability of the financial system, including through macroprudential policies. Because uh, in Europe, when interest rates went up, the value of bonds, for example, of held by banks went down. But because they were all capitalized, it didn't lead to kind of a, a severe problem for the banking system. And third, the transition from manufacturing to services economy. Uh, the services economy uh, probably uses less capital and therefore is less interest sensitive in some ways. And also demand for services is probably more stable. Because uh, classically, like, and we've seen it, uh, the, the, the interest in renovating a house funded by a loan, the interest in buying an expensive car funded by a loan came down quite rapidly with high interest rates. So, so those, the car industry, the construction industry, anything which is a big upfront payment responds quickly. Uh, how sensitive people are to going out for a restaurant meal or going on holiday to high interest rates, you know, it does happen eventually, but probably more slowly. Good. Um, we've got a quick, well, just a slight follow up on that. I don't think you use the term anchor in the presentation. Um, well, I mean, central bankers love that term. You don't see any evidence that inflation expectations have disanchored or become less anchored over this bout. So that's a good question. I mean, uh, if I didn't talk a lot about it in, in the speech, I'm pretty sure I have a footnote to many long, long speeches that I've given on that topic. Uh, so let me say two things which are important. One, now I did talk about in terms of inflation risk. Any risk to the anchor has, has come down quite a bit since last summer. Two, it is uh, indeed uh, long-term inflation expectations being quite stable. But let me mention in this context, something that's relevant for Europe, it's also relevant now in Japan, is there's an element of re-anchoring in 2021. If you ask the market, if you ask professional forecasters before inflation rose. They were still in that, which is the first thing I said in chart one today. They, they were skeptical we would deliver 2%. They, they felt you're going to deliver one and a half. The slow growing economies find it hard to generate inflation. So the first phase in 2021, when inflation actually proved it could move up, is the next, okay, actually, let me think again. And so there was a re-anchoring a re-anchoring from about one and a half, let's say, to two. That's not something that was relevant for America because it was always anchored. But for us, and in Japan now, Japan, Japan is now 
learning that inflation can be positive, can approach 2%. So the re-anchoring from below is relevant. But the, this anchoring above, that goes back to central banks, because uh, we can always solve inflation above 2% by raising interest rates. This is what we're proving. So this, it's very hard to come up with reasons if you believe it, that the central bank will do its job, why you would believe inflation will be above 2% except temporarily. So I do think um, uh, the independence of the ECB uh, is very important. It, it's important that we proved uh, that, that we would do it. Uh, and I think it, it's in that sense, it's been an important episode. Okay, good. And right on cue, we have a question from a Japanese viewer on uh, viewer online. Um, Akisato Suzuki asks, how much impact do you think the Europe, that European countries' increasing defense spending will have on the future course of inflation in the Eurozone? So, so I think there's a different levels uh, to this question. So I think you have to go a little bit granular about will that increase in defense spending, the balance between having more soldiers, essentially, because it becomes a labor market issue mm. versus uh, buying more equipment. And then if you buy more equipment, uh, I mean, obviously, strategically, there's a very high desire that Europe would be quite autonomous in, in its kind of production of military equipment. Uh, so, so I think that's going to be one, one set of issues. Another set of issues is, is this going to increase overall levels of public debt? Or basically, it's going to substitute away from other types of public spending. So those are going to be the uh, ingredients in, in that debate. But uh, I think uh, today, the, uh, I, I won't go beyond that. Good. Okay. Um, Murad Medji asks, uh, given negative consequences of interest rate increases, and given the ECB has utilized unconventional monetary policy in the past, are there future alternatives to interest rates for fighting inflation, particularly in addressing supply side bottlenecks more than focusing on managing demand? So I think uh, there's some very unusual circumstances for the inflation that uh, we've just seen. And so uh, we also had a very big fiscal response. So I think without that fiscal response, uh, in the very high inflation would have lasted for longer. So there was a fiscal role uh, at the late 22. And as I mentioned this year, as that fiscal element goes into reverse, uh, you know, there's more, more for us to do. Uh, but it, in general, no, I think it should be super clear that supply side policies should be evaluated on their own merits. It's not about fighting inflation. It's in about improving the productivity of the European economy. So if Europe says, well, I'm going to improve uh, the efficiency of the port system, if I'm going to improve logistics, everything that might lead to uh, bottlenecks, that's good for on its own merits. The inflation effect, I think, is not the way to think about it. So I think the kind of... Uh, allocation responsibilities where in the end uh, it'd be terrible uh, for a central bank to say it's not our problem it's for fiscal to solve inflation everyone should be clear inflation will come down when you know in line with the central bank mandate but of course we take into account what, what other agencies are doing good a uh, question here just wait for the Thank you. Thank you. Jude Weber from the Financial Times. Is this working? It is. Um, the question was: uh, if if the EU introduces subsidies on, <clears throat> excuse me, on Chinese EVs and other items, what impact that might have on inflation and on your ability to maintain future cuts? Uh, um, I'm presuming they're more likely to Im impose tariffs at this point than subsidies. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, that indeed would be interesting. Um, so what, what I would say is um, the overall inflation rate ha has many components. So I would say the debate about trade policy, uh, again, should focus on, if like it's 
the real impact of those policies. The, the impact of any one sector from, from a, an intervention like that, because essentially the car sector is not big enough. The electric vehicle component of the car sector is not big enough to, to have a, a kind of transformational effect. It would be visible in the inflation data, but not, not in a transformational way. So again, I think let, let's try to disconnect these really big questions, which have very big consequences. It, it's kind of just put, put it in the wrong box to focus on the inflation impact of, of that. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that that would be my sense. What I would say the ECB has published um, studies basically about what happens if the world goes through a serious amount of to economic fragmentation. So what we have said there is essentially, if you do have a generalized, so not you, you asked the truth about one sector, but it is a generalized move towards essentially very different uh, trading blocks. Uh, and especially if it happens suddenly, uh, then there would be a big hit to GDP. Uh, and in turn, of course, if you big hit to GDP, um, and also if you've, the fact that import costs are going up, uh, there will be consequences for inflation. But I think you have to balance the, the direct fact that imports become more expensive with the fact the European economy will be very damaged by, 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 that, by that scenario. Uh, so, you know, th th these issues and our financial stability review, which came out two weeks ago, also is a, a nice appendix on the, the kind of uh, geopolitical risk and the financial system. You also think about how the financial system would be would be affected. Um, just to follow up on that, Philip, I'm not asking you to speculate, but just from your looking at the evidence and data to date, the discussion around deglobalization or slowing of globalization, how do you assess the evidence simply to date? So let me come back to this, because I think the most recent thing we published on it in the Financial Stability Review. Uh, right now, there's a lot of uh, risk assessing going on. Because, of course, investment, people have to look forward. It's not about what's happened to date. It's how is the uncertainty about the future affecting decision making? I think it's only one direction. If you have uncertainty about the future, it's very natural to delay investment. And investment in Europe has been fairly quiet for the last year, at least. That is consistent with people wanting to see the dust settle on, on uh, some of these big questions. So I, I think, uh, I would say, of course, uh, many people are, are trying to, to navigate improving uh, economic security while still maintaining a, a global orientation of the European economy. Uh, and uh, the more that is maintained, the more limited the kind of macro consequence. Okay, uh, there's a question down there. Uh, hi, um, uh, Donald Donovan from the, the Irish Independent. In hindsight, and hindsight obviously is 2020, but do you think the ECB acted too late um, in in beginning uh, the, 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 the raising cycle? And I suppose if not, what was gained by the delay? And the, and and not directly related, but probably related, the, the deflationary sort of pressures that you outlined as being the kind of what was front and centre when you joined the ECB, those very long-term trends. Do you think that that is still there somewhere, that there's a potential for that deflationary pressure to return? So um, these are very natural questions. And uh, uh, I think the best way for me to answer is the ECB has recently published a working paper. The staff have published a working paper, which went back over this episode. Now, again, uh, I think uh, there's a lot more to do. Um, so this is a, the one answer as of now. And what that working paper said was, if we had known uh, at the time what inflation would look like in 22, 23, of course we would have moved earlier. So as you say, with the benefit of high, we would have moved earlier if we had known what was coming down the tracks. A lot of that has to do with the Russia-Ukraine war. A second question is, given the data we had at the time, the forecasts we had, uh, approximately the answer is, well, maybe you could have moved in March 
22, rather than waiting until the summer. But in March 22, we had the Russia-Ukraine war. We published scenarios then basically saying uh, it's hard to attach probabilities, but one probability is a much more severe impact on the, on the European economy. So, so there is a case for waiting. That's the case for waiting is let the... And then the third conclusion is, even if we had moved in like early 22, the impact on inflation would have been fairly limited. So again, to repeat, if we had known the forces that would take hold in uh, 2022 after the war, we would have raised more, a lot more, more quickly, and inflation would have come down more quickly. But in the absence of that crystal ball, um, ballpark the decisions, um, you know, put like this, were, were kind of consistent with the mo with the way the economics world thinks. Uh, but again, uh, there's been many rounds of this into future, and I would say until we bring inflation back to target, until this job is over, uh, the overall evaluation does depend on this job being completed. It's not completed now. So the discussion about having a, a rate cut next week it is not a declaration of victory. It's just basically saying, uh, which is why I said this morning uh, in, in the interview, is, is this year, there's still a lot of cost pressure in the European economy. We can maybe remove uh, the top level of restriction, but we're not going to a normal situation this year. Uh, and so it's still uh, we're still in the middle of this, Donald, so uh, we can come back to it. But you can find on the ECB website that, that, that study, which kind of... Uh, uh, I've kind of tried to paraphrase. Okay, I think we'll have time for one. Well, you're sitting together, so maybe if, if they're short ones, if you could both, we'll take two. Just sure. Over um, Olivia from Bloomberg. Um, I know you've already said, um, you know, you'll take a meeting by meeting approach, but some of your more hawkish colleagues have come out and said, you know, maybe a second cut in September. And I, I just wondered, you know, what's your, I guess your personal opinion on this? You know, would you rule out July? Just if you can give us any more of your opinion, <laughs> much appreciated. Sure, I, 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 I'm very happy to say my, my, my personal opinion, which is we, we should not pre-commit. We should go meeting by meeting. Uh, we should let the data help us. Um, I, uh, Oshin Maxwini, uh, chairperson of the Economic Society in UCC. Um, just going back to currency, uh, again, your colleague was kind of very polite in how we put the depreciation of the euro against the dollar in the last several years. Um, I think now does that impact have a, higher amplification with regards perhaps energy prices and now heating tensions in the Middle East, do those factors come into your consideration um, for the rate cut now and for the future? Going forward? So let me make a couple, I mean, of course, energy is quite important. Uh, one, we, we're always going to be looking at energy prices, but let, let me just emphasize the fact that the, the convention is that oil is quoted in dollars, for example, doesn't mean that it's sticky in dollars. So, so there isn't really a kind of mechanical relationship. Here's the dollar price of oil. Here's the euro dollar exchange rate, and here's the translation. Because if the euro dollar rate moves, then demand for oil would move also. Because European uh, demanders of oil would change their demand. So, so the price of oil in dollars would would be affected. So I, I wouldn't worry about uh, that element, the interconnection between the exchange rate. There are some complicated interconnections uh, because of how, to, how the oil producers of the world uh, spend their money. But by and large, I would keep them separate. Uh, you know, let's worry about the energy prices, whether you quote in euro or dollars, uh, and let's worry about the, the exchange rates. Thank you. Okay, we're sticklers for timekeeping here. It's two o'clock. Apologies to those who want to ask further questions. I know they're here and in the and, and online, so apologies about that. But Philip has been very generous in giving his time so far. Uh, so uh, thank you, Philip, uh, for coming, and thanks everyone for joining. I hope you had uh, uh, an informative afternoon, which I'm sure you've had. Thank you. Thank you.